Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today. At work, there seems to be a strange phenomena of people bringing food and naming it and putting it in the refrigerator. Yesterday, I, I ate a wonderful tuna fish sandwich named Kevin. I like that. The Japanese eat very little fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British or Americans. The French eat a lot of fat and also suffer fewer heart attacks than British or Americans. The Japanese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than British or Americans. The Italians drink excessive amounts of red wine and also suffer fewer attacks than the British or, or Americans. The Germans drink a lot of beer, lots of beers, and eat lots of sausages and fats and suffer fewer heart attacks than the British or Americans. So the conclusion is, eat and drink what you like. Speaking English is apparently what kills you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Father, we, we just want to honor you today. We are gathered together unto you. And, and everything that, that takes place in this building today, let it glorify you. Holy Spirit, have, have freedom today. We just say, come, Holy Spirit. Come and release the kingdom. Do what you desire, Lord. We're able to let go of our grip on, on what has to happen or what needs to happen. Lord, we just ask you to come and fill us afresh with your presence today, Lord. In Jesus' name. Today I want to continue talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the one who Jesus said would, would be our helper. Uh, so, so let's look at Paul's benediction in his last letter to the Corinthian church. We, we've read it a couple times in the last number of weeks. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Father, we thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your love, Heavenly Father. And we desire to understand and experience fully the fellowship, the communion that you've called us into with the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak your word to our hearts today. Give us ears to hear what we need to, need to hear. And I pray that you would awaken in each one of us just a, a fresh passion and hunger and love for you, a desire for intimacy with you. Holy Spirit, come. Draw us unto yourself in Jesus' name. This verse that we just read, uh, the Godhead perfectly expressed in, in one verse, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. This Greek word that's translated communion is the word koinonia. And in the New Testament, it is usually either translated communion or, or fellowship. But, but it's an interesting word because it, it expresses the, the idea of, number one, a deep and intimate fellowship. And number two, out of this, this intimate communion, there, there is the forming of a partnership, a, a, a working together in that union. And number three, there is also this idea of distribution in the sense that out of this intimacy and fellowship, with the Holy Spirit, and out of this partnership that is formed, the, 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 the resources of the kingdom begin to be distributed or released around us. You know, it started, um, something started in me about two weeks before I went on vacation. Um, and, and it had to do with, with the Holy Spirit. 
I, I feel like many times in my life, I, I've, I've felt this, this drawing by the Lord to, to get closer to him. And I never want to do that for the fruit that comes out of it, but there always is fruit that comes out of it. But I, but I, I really feel like the Lord, you're going to hear it through me this morning, the, the message I sh shared before I went on vacation. It, I almost felt like I, the, it was the Holy Spirit through me just saying, I want to have intimacy with you. I want you to know me. To really know me. Don't settle for religion because you've been called into a relationship. And your heart actually longs for it, desires it. There, there are certain things that can only be satisfied in you from God. There's a deep inside of you that calls out to a deep inside of God that only he has the answer to. And I, I think sometimes we, we get distracted and we try to satisfy that, that deep desire of our heart. Oh, we, or maybe we're just trying to numb it. I don't know. But we, 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 we try to find it in other things. When in truth, the only thing that will satisfy my heart is intimacy with God through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. Now, let me make a statement for us to think about. It's in your notes. If, if we want to have greater kingdom fruitfulness, it will come from a greater depth of fellowship with Holy Spirit. What you desire in God is found in the Holy Spirit. The intimacy with God that your heart cries out for is found in the Holy Spirit. Now, before I went on vacation, um, there have been times in my life where it was like I got hungry for more. And I, I don't know that I could take credit for that hunger. Because I, I think sometimes God just comes and makes us supernaturally hungry. Hungry for more. And see, it's a powerful thing because Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? They shall be filled. When, when, when you cry out to God for more, suddenly there becomes more that's available to you. In fact, there are things that God has reserved for the hungry. In, in Luke chapter 1, he says, God fills the hungry with good things. But those who are satisfied, content with what they have, they go home empty. And so I I recognize that hunger, when, when, when I begin to feel hunger stirring in me, I get excited. Because I don't know about you, but I've never had a time in my life when that hunger has come and something in God didn't come as a result of it. You know, we talked about the various revivals that had taken place in the world, you know, some of them, and how oftentimes it's just a few people that will come together and cry out to God. It's like they, they, they get hungry. You know, the, the Welsh revival had taken place. The world was hearing about it, but nothing like the world hears about things now. I mean, news didn't travel fast, but people were hearing about it. And there was a group of people in, in Los Angeles that happened to be on a certain street called Azusa Street that gathered and began to cry out to God. It was like just a small pocket of people hungry for more of God. And God showed up. Because that's what he does. That's who he is. So it started before I went on vacation. And, and I have to say, it kind of messed up my vacation. Not a bad thing. It just caused it to be a little bit different. Uh, 
I feel like God has just been personally challenging me to just re-examine the Holy Spirit in Scripture and his everyday role in the life of the believer. And, and see, sometimes our perspective on things might not be accurate. Sometimes we have acquired lenses, so to speak, that we look at things through. I read my Bible through those lenses. I, I look at all the experiences that I have in my life through those lenses. And sometimes we need to take those lenses off and say, hey, God, teach me. Speak to me. I, I, I want to hear. I don't want to read my Bible through lenses. I, I want to say, Holy Spirit, you know what I'm going to do this year? Now, I, I've done this a number of times. I, I try to read the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice every year. And so I, I'm in the Word all the time. But every once in a while, I have a, a time where I think, I, I want to take off my lenses of all my preconceived ideas, all the things that I... I, I maybe read scripture through, interpret things that happen around me through. I want to take that off and, and read the Bible like I've never read it before, like I'm on this new adventure discovering God, discovering the kingdom, discovering the things of God. Talking too fast. <clears throat> well, when I got saved, I was 19 years old. Now, I had been to church, been to Sunday school, and so I had all these concepts of God. You know, as a, as a kid, you, you acquire things. You know, maybe you picked up some watching TV. Maybe you picked up some just listening to your friends or, or something. But you have these ideas. And so now I'm 19 years old. I've always had a Bible. My, my grandma bought me a Bible. I had my name on it. But I never read it. I mean, except to maybe look up a verse or something like that. But I didn't, like, read it as a book. Well, now I'm a Christian, and I'm starting to read my Bible and I'm running into things that are a little bit different than what I had perceived. Things about God. Things about myself. Things about salvation. And, and I, I realize I need to take off all those preconceived things and read my Bible like I'd never read it before. In fact, I want to encourage you. As we head into 2024, would you take off your glasses? That might sound strange to somebody not hearing the rest of the message. But would, would you be willing to take off the lenses that you look at things through and say, God, teach me. Teach me afresh like I'm a brand new believer. Like I don't already know this stuff. And uh, because there, people have preconceived ideas. But let me share one with you. My wife and I, when we were on vacation, we went to, we, we like to go to movies. Uh, it helps us to kind of let go of all the, all the things we're carrying. And we saw this movie called Radical. Now, it's in Spanish, but it ha has great English subtitles. <laughs> and it's about this guy that uh, is a teacher in a, in a small community, a poor area of Mexico. And he goes with the idea of just doing things different. Instead of just giving information out, giving information out, he d he's decided he's going to try to pull the kids into it, into the discovery and the excitement about learning. And uh, he runs into all kinds of crazy things as a result. I, I really recommend this movie. It's a powerful movie about a guy that really wanted to make a difference in kids' lives, that had not given up, that had not just given up on, you know, you become a teacher because you want to bless kids, and then sometimes in the, in, the, in the midst of that, you can almost give up on that because you, you see all these contrary things happening, and just, now you're just going through the motions. But he said, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. And um, great show, but, but we went to see uh, Journey to Bethlehem. Has anybody seen it? Wow. Nobody, not even Cheryl. Uh, it, it's kind of a retelling of the, of the birth of Jesus, the things that led up to his birth and his, his birth. But I get a kick out of it all the time when I run into this because in many na nativity scenes, did you know, have you ever noticed that the three wise men are there? 
and, and it's like they're, Jesus is, baby Jesus is born, the wise men have come to give the gifts. Do you know that that's nowhere in the Bible? Jesus was a toddler when the three kings showed up. And, and I, I guess I noticed it in, the, in Journey to Bethlehem, too. I just thought, isn't that interesting? It's like, the, it's tr tradition. It must be true. I, I'm not even going to check the Bible because it's what I think, what I believe. And, and so sometimes we, we just have to be willing to take off our lenses, what we've been looking at things through, and say, God, let me see your perspective. Let me see through your eyes. I, I, I want to encourage you to read your Bible afresh this coming year. I really believe God is going to unlock some things. Now, now read your Bible like you've never read it before, like you've never had a Bible. But don't do this. Don't do this because your pastor said to do it. Don't do this because you're just this super disciplined person. Only do it if you are hungry for more. Hunger is so important. Let me tell you what hunger does. I quoted it already, but Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who and hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's this amazing promise to the hungry, and the promise is they will be filled. That's why a hungry and thirsty person is so blessed. Because their hunger creates an opportunity for, for an outpouring, for a filling to come from God. God fills the hungry with good things. Hunger pulls on things in the spirit realm. It pulls them into manifestation. Hunger is part of how faith works. Because hunger is birthed in desire. And faith is whatsoever things you desire. When you pray. Well, what, what is the definition of faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, desire. The evidence of things not seen. See, hungry people are able to contain more than people who aren't hungry. Let me say it this way. In your notes, God increases the spiritual capacity of hungry people. He enables them con to contain more. And just as a natural appetite, we know that that's a sign of health in the natural. Spiritual hunger is a sign of spiritual health. When you're physically healthy, you have a physical appetite. But when you get sick, you may lose your appetite. But one of the signs that you're starting to get healthy is your appetite comes back. When you're spiritually healthy, you have a spiritual appetite. Now, why is hunger so important? Because it will pull you out of the places you have settled into. We settle so easy. We might gain some ground. We might, you know, see some great things happen. But then we just kind of settle. We settle so easily. In your notes, hunger will put, uh, pull us out of the places where we settle. It will pull you out of apathy. It will pull you out of mediocrity. It will pull you out of just settling into places you are comfortable in. Hunger gives you a, a drive to press into God. It gives you a drive to, to diligently seek him. And we know, according to Hebrews 11.6, that God rewards those who diligently seek him. So I, I invited you to join me in this reading of my Bible afresh, 2024, there, there is something else I'm doing. I, I really didn't know whether I was going to invite you into this or not. But I, I want to invite you into this. During the remainder of this year, it's part of the, the challenge to me to re-examine the Holy Spirit's role. I, I, I'm going to focus on, I, I'm not going to stop my normal reading. I'm going to do that, but this is extracurricular. Is it okay to do extracurricular Bible reading? Yeah. Be okay. So I'm focusing on John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Five chapters that all take place between the Last Supper and the rest of Jesus. All these chapters take place in one evening. These are Jesus' final words to his disciples before his arrest. He's about to leave, but that's okay. In fact, he said it's good that he goes, but he's going to send another to be with him. He's not going to leave them as orphans. 
He would come to them, but as the Holy Spirit. Jesus had been fathering them, but the Holy Spirit was about to step into that role. He would be the one who would guide them into all truth. He would be the one who would bring to remembrance the teachings of Jesus when they needed to remember them. He is the one that would father and lead them in their faith. And see, much of what we know about the Holy Spirit is found in these five chapters. I, I want to encourage you in the last five weeks of this year to spend some time in these chapters, particularly with a desire, a hunger even, to know the Holy Spirit better. When we read the book of Acts, we, dis we discover this interaction between the, the early church and the Holy Spirit. He is so active, and he's mentioned so often, thus says the Holy Spirit, you know, and uh, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? You know, and, and he, he, he's, uh, Paul tried to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit forbade them. They were going to go to Asia, but God didn't, the Spirit didn't allow them. You know, and you see the Holy Spirit all over the place. Why? Because the early church knew that they were actually being led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 14. He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. As, as a child of God, the Spirit lives inside of us, and he will lead us. But, but wait a minute. Aren't, aren't we led by, what the, by the Bible? Aren't we supposed to get our direction from the Word of God? Now, I'm going to say something that could be misunderstood. But I trust that you know me well enough and that you know I'm a Bible guy. I, I believe in the Word of God. I believe it is the measuring stick to judge everything else. But I want to just read a quote to you. This is a Bill Johnson quote. It's difficult to get the same fruit as the early church when we value a book they didn't have more than the Holy Spirit they did have. It's difficult to experience the same fruit that the early church experienced when we put more value on a book that they didn't even have than we do on the Spirit of God that they did have. You know, the New Testament was not canonized until 350, 400 A.D. So the early church did not have the New Testament. You know, a church might have had a, had a letter or a gospel or, you know, had some, but, but they didn't have what we have today. But you know what they did have? They had the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. And because they didn't have the New Testament, they really had to lean into the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Old Covenant of the Old Testament was their Bible. And they were able to, the Holy Spirit was able to take things out of the Old Covenant that, that, that came right into the New Covenant. And it was like, what did somebody say this way? They said, the Old Covenant is the New Covenant concealed. The New Covenant is the Old Covenant revealed. I don't know. We know there's definitely two different covenants, two different kinds of relationship that we, that we could have with God in, in this covenant that we are living in is absolutely amazing. You know, in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would come upon a person to do something, to fulfill something, to say something, but that's not what we have. The Holy Spirit doesn't come upon us for moments like that. He actually has chosen to live inside of us and to take up residence inside of us. See, what, what did the Holy Spirit have? What did the early church have? They had the Holy Spirit living inside of them and they recognized how they needed him to lead them. And, 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 and they saw God do such amazing things. Now, you know me and what I just said, I am not trying to minimize the value of God's word or the new covenant. I'm just saying we are called to be led by the Spirit of God. He lives right inside of us. How well do you know him? 
Do you hunger to know him? To really know him? I, I, I talked a little bit about this, but let me read it. What time is it? It's only 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? 10 09. 10 09. Okay. Okay. So Samuel is going to pray, and God's going to stop the clock. <laughs> I know he's got faith for it. But I want to read a passage in, Luke, in Acts 16. It's a short passage, but I, I think it reveals how dependent the early church was on the Holy Spirit. This is Paul and Silas. They are obeying the words of Jesus, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They are traveling and, and preaching the gospel wherever they go. Verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word of God or preach the word in Asia. Now, they're, they're, they're following the words of Jesus. That, that's like following the Bible, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. But when they went, they were, they were forbidden to go to a certain place like it wasn't the right time yet. Verse 7. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So now they're trying to go someplace else, and the Spirit of God stopped them again. They, they are, they're, they're obeying the Word, but they're simultaneously being led by the Spirit of God. So passing through Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with them, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel there. Can you see how dependent Paul and Silas are on the Holy Spirit? They were obeying the words of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is further directing them. They, they were doing what, what the Bible says to do, but he, the Holy Spirit was specifically directing them in their application of, the, of doing the word of God. As you and I set out to obey the Bible, to be led by the scriptures, as we desire to put it into practice in our lives, we must be attentive to the Holy Spirit so that he can lead us more specifically in our journey. Don't think... Let me say it this way. Don't you think the Holy Spirit would be critical in the implementing of God's word in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of, the, of God. He's the third person of the Godhead. He always glorifies the Son. He brings to remembrance the teachings of Jesus. He reveals Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. And when Jesus is glorified, the kingdom comes. God's will is done. We were created to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We were created to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit. But God has given each one of us a free will. We can choose to long for him. We can choose to know him, to press into knowing him. Or we cannot. We can choose to busy ourselves with other things. We can just <coughs> allow ourselves to be distracted. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary, Mary, Martha was distracted with much serving. Who was she serving? Well, I think she thought she was serving Jesus serving God. I mean, Jesus came with his entourage to her house. Now, now she's the, you know, very hospitable person, I think, and, and she's just trying to, you know, she's working hard. She's doing everything she can, and yet she, she's distracted, Jesus said, from what? From the intimacy that Mary was experiencing with Jesus sitting at his feet. Do you know it's very easy to get distracted with much serving. It's very easy to be doing all kinds of things for God. 
and to end up distracted from the intimacy that actually is what will, would allow me to be incredibly fruitful as I serve God, incredibly fruitful in my family life. That intimacy with him is actually the key. But see, we can also choose to present ourselves to him every day as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, reporting for duty, Holy Spirit. What's the assignment today? What adventure are we going on today? I, I am your willing vessel. I'm not done yet, but could we stand for a moment? I just want you to pray something with me this morning. I believe that God is inviting every single one of us into a greater intimacy with him through his spirit that lives inside of us. So would you just pray this prayer with me? Holy Spirit, I present myself to you as a living sacrifice. Use me today for your glory. I really want to know you. You are my helper. You are my guide into all truth. Help me to see you more clearly. Baptize me afresh in you. Purify my heart in Jesus' name. Please be seated, but just stay in his presence. Quédate en la presencia del Señor. We know that when we were born again, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, came to take up residence in us, and we became the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's such uh, an amazing thing. In all honesty, my, my mind has a hard time wrapping around it. My spirit's fine with it. But, but my mind doesn't know what to do with that sometimes. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul said, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So he lives inside of us. That's what actually caused the new birth. Paul's benediction says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now that he's in you, commune with him. You've been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. Now live to glorify God with your body. In, in both the last message I shared before going on vacation and in this message this morning, I really feel like, it, it's, it's weird, I feel like the Holy Spirit is pleading through me to, to respond to his invitation to intimacy. It's for every believer. It's not for certain ones. It's for everyone. It, it, it's what your heart longs for. It's what, your, what, it's what he longs for, too. Break out of the rat race. Break out of the busyness of life. Break free from all of those things that are vying for your attention. Be still and know that he is God. Go into the secret place and shut the door. Spend time with the one who loves you like no other. Don't be afraid of getting emotional. Don't be afraid of falling in love with him. It's, it's called returning to your first love. Don't be afraid of emotions. Now, I know we were taught, you know, don't let your emotions run your life or, or control your life. Don't, don't allow that to happen. But just to be honest, 
Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember what you felt like? Do you remember how, like, I, I remember thinking, I'm going to explode. I want to stand on my roof and shout that Jesus is real. You know what I mean? There was nothing wrong with that emotion. In fact, I think God wants us to have intimacy with him in such a way where, where our emotions are real, where, where I, could, I could cry at the drop of a hat. In fact, sometimes when I'm talking about how much the Holy Spirit wants us, wants to have that intimacy with us, I, I can hardly keep my composure because I feel that. There's nothing wrong with emotions. Yeah, we don't want emotions running our lives, but you know your emotions will line up with the kingdom. You, you can, you can, your emotions will line up with the things of God. You know, Jesus was moved with compassion, and so he, a miracle, every, every time Jesus is moved with compassion, a miracle happens. Do you notice that? Whether it was multiplying food to feed a multitude or, or touching the leper who said, if you want to, you could make me whole. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. We're just going to close in a time of worship today. You may have uh, grown up in a stream of Christianity that told you, you know, as far as your emotions, you know, just, you know, this is about, this is about knowing all the right stuff. This is about having all your ducks in a row, all your doctrines perfectly lined up. I just want to say baloney. Now, I, I'm not anti doctrine because there are certain doctrines that if you depart from them, you depart from Christianity. But there is a whole lot of stuff <laughs> that people tend to get tangled up in that actually hinders them from their intimacy with God. I, um, I don't want my emotions dictating my life, but how can you have a, a relationship with God and, and have no emotion. How can you have God living inside of you and, and know that he loves you more than you can imagine and not have emotions? All relationships involve emotions. The Song of Songs is a very emotional book. It's a prophetic book about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride. Let's stand. I just want to pray over you. Then we're going to sing a song. Maybe, maybe that last song. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Um, let's pray. Just, just receive. Holy Spirit, we want to know you. And I pray that you would help each one of us to develop a, a greater intimacy with you. To be in fellowship with you. Awaken our love for you. Father, your word says that we love you you because you first loved us. Your love awakens our love. Let us experience your love afresh and let it awaken our love for you, O oh God. Forgive us. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Teach us your ways, Holy Spirit. Come, fill us afresh with your person. In Jesus' name, amen.
to us a child is unto us a son is given unto us a child is born unto us a son is given we call you Forgive me, I'm uh, one of those guys that cannot play my guitar and talk at the same time. So I have to stop playing to give you the benediction. But I want to invite the prayer teams to come up, be available to pray with people today. Um, I can sing, but I just can't talk. <laughs> Second Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know this one was coming for the benediction? Maybe. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you, saints. Have a great week.